So it's get behind me, Satan. You know, I'd, I just want to say, like, wait a minute. If I could talk to Jesus in this moment, I'd be like, isn't this Peter? This is your main man, right? This is the one that you're going to, you know, build your church on. You know, the one that you said that will, whatever he binds on earth will be bound on earth and whatever he sets loose on, well, you get the point. It's quite a shift. And Jesus' tone, it, it signals this kind of, this change. Clearly, he isn't having this conversation. So when looking up illustrations for this event online, you'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't, uh, that I found pick Peter depicted with a pair of ram's horns coming right out of his forehead, like huge ram's horns. Um, and in Western art, Peter is often white, right? But there was a color change here too. Peter, who is, was white, is now black. Not brown, mind you. He was black. So there is some significance in what's happening here. Other images take Peter out of the equation altogether, and you see this sort of dark, shadowy figure take his place in this moment. All that's missing in those pictures is a pitchfork. Right, his giant wings behind him. And then Nancy found this great picture that's kind of like on our slideshow uh, right before this service with sort of Jesus giving uh, Peter his back. And if, you, if there was a caption under there, it'd be sort of equivalent to the modern day colloquialism, talk to the hand, right? Um, I was hopeful when, I, when Nancy found this image because my thoughts turned from who was being addressed in that moment, right? Was it Satan? Or was it Peter after seeing those images? My thought turns to who, from who was being addressed uh, and from trying to kind of explain this weird spirit possession thing to you all to more of a story about position. Does that make sense? Not possession, but position. It's just kind of one way to look at the scenario. There's lots of different stories. But I sympathize with Peter. I wouldn't want my best friend to go to Jerusalem and be killed. I'd want him to stay. I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. God forbid that. And there you go. Get behind me, Nick. And to Peter's credit, he, he takes this rebuke from Jesus. He takes it, and he gets behind Jesus, and then you know what? You know what he does? He follows Jesus up this mountain, because that's where we are in the story. He follows Jesus up the mountain, and with James and John, he has his mind blown. Because before them, Jesus is transfigured. And Moses and Elijah show up on either side, almost as if in response to the question that people are asking about Jesus. Like, who is this guy? Is he Moses or Elijah? Well, they show up right there. Now, you'll remember in that story that Peter was scared because we just heard this story like three weeks ago. And the disciples that were with him were scared too. But they weren't scared enough not to ask a similar question. You remember? They're sort of like cowering down, and then Peter gets up and he says, Hey, you're here. Why don't I build some houses and we can all hang out up here and just chill out? We don't have to go to Jerusalem. Same kind of thing again, right? Jesus, don't go. 
Jesus's mind is made up, however, and he tells his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, and to be there with me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. So whether Jesus is on the plain or whether he's going up to the mountaintop, the position, right? Not the possession, the position that we, are, that we as his disciples always have to be aware of is where we are in relationship to Jesus. Are we behind him? Are we trying to push or pull him? Are we trying to arrest his descent on the mountaintop? And this is hard for us to do for a couple of reasons. I mean, this is hard language that we are hearing from Jesus. Take up your cross. Take up your cross in the midst of your own suffering. You cannot be my disciples unless you love me more than you love your wife. You cannot be my disciple unless you love me more than you love your husband, your brother, your sister, your kids. The side of Jesus that has us grapple with not being able to be his disciples stretches us and confronts us in every domain of our lives. It's hard language. But there's this guy that I like to read. His name's Rowan Williams. You've probably heard of him. He's the former Archbishop of Canterbury. He said, the point is that if you're going to be where the master is, those things that come naturally and comfortably are not necessarily going to define where you find yourself. The place where we are going to be is defined by the master. Not by us or indeed by any of our qualities or our relationships, because a disciple is not greater than the master, right? Furthermore, being where Jesus is, our position in relationship to him is not just about our own situational awareness, our own personal relationship with our Savior, or our own spiritual awareness, but it is about where being where Jesus is, and being where Jesus chooses to go. Being where Jesus is means being in the company of people whose company Jesus chooses to keep. And we are reminded that that, most, that means most often that the words comfortable are not gonna be anywhere near that. And it's way different from a society, right? That says, that opens the doors for us and says, welcome, you've earned it, come on in, take your rest, stay here. This must never happen to you. And this is precisely because Jesus chooses the company of the excluded. He chooses the company of the disreputable. He chooses to be with the wretched, the self-hating, the poor, those who suffer, those who are diseased, and those were those with no other place to go. So that is where we are going to find ourselves if we are going to be where Jesus is, if we are going to get behind Jesus, if our discipleship is not intermittent or made up of fair weather platitudes, we will find ourselves in the sort of human company 
as Jesus is in. It is once again a reminder that our discipleship is not easy at times. It's not about choosing our own company, taking over the agenda, or directing where we are going, but choosing the company of Jesus or getting used to the fact of having our company chosen for us. And this is big because ultimately, as a consequence of that discipleship, we will have to get used to the fact that Jesus sometimes exposes himself to mortal risk. And we don't want him to do that. And we ourselves don't need to do that or want to do that. Sometimes it means we need to set our face towards Jerusalem. And instead of responding to that situation with our own comfort and conveniences in mind, we should remain expectant and aware, trusting that Jesus is trying to show us something in those moments. Because some of what Peter heard in that moment where Jesus rebuked him only had to deal with death. He didn't hear that last bit that said, I'm going to raise it up, right? He responded to the death bit. Had Peter been listening to what else Jesus was saying, he would have heard him say something far greater than the violence of it all. He would have heard about Jesus rising again, which meant that love would ultimately confound death upon the cross. And that is our hope. Jesus clearly requires awareness and expectancy from his disciples, watching as well as listening. Jesus channels, absorbs, and ultimately redeems what happens on the cross. And that is to be our pattern. And if we take that to heart, and we are aware of where we are in relationship to Jesus day in and day out, then we will realize something beautiful, that death is in fact not the end of anything, but that by turning our face towards Jerusalem, towards our own crosses, might mean that God is in fact calling us to life.